So welcome everybody. Can you hear me all fine? Good, good. All right. So this, uh, in the next hour or so, what we'll do is we'll talk about some of the vulnerabilities and uh, in SCADA systems, specifically vulnerabilities that we saw in the last year or so. So let's, let, let's get started. Uh, the agenda here is to, before going into uh, deep diving into vulnerabilities, what are SCADA vulnerabilities, which components they are into, we'll, I'll do a brief uh, introduction just to make sure that all of us here are on the same page because, as you know, the term SCADA is uh, probably overused for a lot of different types of systems, and so we'll, we'll, we'll just uh, make sure that uh, all of us are talking about the same thing here. After that, we'll do a vulnerability analysis of the 2013 SCADA vulnerabilities that we have seen so far. We'll uh, look at some of the recommendations and some of the proposals of what uh, you should do if you are in charge of securing these SCADA systems or in any way related to SCADA critical infrastructure or industrial control systems. So let's get started. Uh, and, and, and yeah, uh, I think uh, this is a small enough group. For SCADA, it's always a small enough group. So feel free to just ask a question any time of the presentation. If I have uh, some slides in the later part of the presentation, I'll just uh, say that, okay, we'll, 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 we'll discuss it later, or I'll, I'll try to answer as we go. So uh, SCADA systems are called with various different types of name. Uh, supervisory control and data acquisition or SCADA systems, distributed control systems, industrial control systems, critical infrastructure systems. So what, what do you sort of think or envision when you think of a SCADA system? Do you, do you think of any of these, which is basically, let's say, electrical power lines, uh, petroleum pipelines, windmills, or mm, it can be categorized as factory floors, and in this case, since uh, everyone loves sugar, I have a donut factory just churning out donuts. <laughs> or it could be an automobile plant where robots are assembling something on an assembly plant, or so on and so forth. So uh, all these systems are a little bit different. So the ones are on the top are really distributed. They can be thousands and thousands of miles long. So one of the components, so some of the components on for example, that gas pipeline could be miles and miles, uh, states or countries away where the control system is. And they are typically called as SCADA or systems. The ones on the bottom, they are huge, but they are typically uh, confined to one huge plant. And uh, all the components are typically in one or two plants, which are either nearby or connected somehow. So yes, all these are examples of SCADA systems, and I'm going to use uh, the term SCADA a little loosely in this presentation for industrial control systems, for distributed control systems, for uh, critical infrastructure systems, because I think a lot of them have uh, various similarities in them. So why, why SCADA and why AppSec? So this is an AppSec conference, Application Security OWASP type of conference. And typically, uh, I talk about SCADA stuff on more, um, more of industrial control systems or those type of conferences. So why talk about SCADA at an AppSec conference? And I think the answer for that is this one hour of presentation. And by the end of the presentation, I think it should be clear that uh, SCADA is becoming pretty relevant for applications for AppSec or OWASP type of uh, security. So SCADA is nothing new, right? SCADA systems have been there for like 30, 40, some are like 80, 90, 50 years old. And there have always been accidents in SCADA systems. Mm, some of the examples here are to liquid uh, pipeline failures. So our government analysis, the analysis, when there is a failure, there is always an analysis of why that failure happened. If it was a machine uh, fault, if it was an operator fault, what went wrong? So the links here are some of uh, the links from the U.S. government and NERC on what happened in some of the past accidents, power failures, liquid pipeline failures, or some of the other accidents. Uh, and again, you have all these links on, on, on the slides, so you, 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 you'll, you'll get them later. 
So there, there have always been accidents in SCADA systems. That's nothing new. What we have seen uh, in the past few years is there have been cases of vandalism. So accidents, I sort of consider it as, well, bad, but still it's, uh, it's pretty innocent. It's, it's just an accident. Now we turn a notch up, which is vandalism. And the example that I have here is um, an example from Seattle, where some vandals, they destroyed these rubber gaskets from electrical power lines. And they were just vandals. They were not really, in, they didn't really know what it would cause. They just, I, or I guess for fun, destroyed it. And uh, it didn't cause a major power failure or something. The electric company did reroute power, um, but it was a lot of hassle because they had to buy emergency power from some other power company, reroute it, and all the logistics behind it. So, okay, there were accidents, there were cases of vandalism. There were, uh, there, there were a lot of insider uh, type of attacks in uh, SCADA systems. And the example here is a pretty famous example from Australia where a disgruntled employee, he was fired from a water treatment plant, a sewage plant. And what he does the very next day is he comes to the parking lot, he knows the wireless uh, access point keys, he knows how to get in, he has the blueprint of the plant. Being disgruntled, he opens up the um, the gates of the sewage system into clean water rivers and uh, parks. It causes a big embarrassment for not only the the water treatment plan but also generally for for the state and even for, I guess for the country because it was all over the news. So oh, this thing happened in Australia. Some disgruntled employee just opened up uh, wastewater into good water. But what we have seen more and what uh, the term that I guess has been <laughs> uh, used or rather overused these days is uh, APT, which is uh, Advanced Persistent Thread. And the link that I have here is from Semantic, which is a white paper comparing the Dooku worm with Stuxnet. And uh, sort of uh, the paper concludes that the, the, the same people who wrote Stuxnet also wrote Dooku, which, uh, which was a similar type of worm. How many people of here have heard about Stuxnet? Okay, Dooku, okay. So you're, you're in the right session. I am in the right session. <laughs> um, so um, when we look at uh, the next slide is of the 2013 uh, vulnerabilities in, uh, not just 2013 vulnerabilities, but vulnerabilities that have been in SCADA system for the last three years from 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, and an estimate of 2013. Now, two weeks ago, a couple of researchers, they, dis they, they said that they will disclose 40 vulnerabilities by the end of this month. So my estimate is wrong here, and um, I think it, by the end of 2013, we will see the uh, same amount of vulnerabilities reported for SCADA system as they were in 2012. Now, take these numbers by a little bit of grain of salt because uh, everybody of you must have heard that SCADA systems, SCADA vendors are typically 10 years behind typical IT vendors. And I, I sort of agree with that because uh, a lot of SCADA vendors still are, I mean, there are a few vendors like, Cement, uh, like Siemens who are really forthcoming about vulnerabilities who at least have a vulnerability listing page on their website where you can go and see what are the latest Siemens vulnerabilities, how can I patch. But not all vendors have grown to that level of uh, maturity, I guess. So something that we saw 10 years ago in the early, uh, in the late 90s uh, with Microsoft and others is a lot of vulnerabilities going on, and Microsoft started this security program, I think, which just uh, had its 10-year anniversary last month, Microsoft Patch Tuesday. I mean, I'm pretty sure all of you are aware of that. And uh, the program really matured in 10 years. So now in the IT type of world, still there are vendors are pretty forthcoming. They disclose their vulnerabilities. They give as much technical information as possible about the vulnerabilities. And there is no sort of a, it's actually good to come up and tell you, tell that, okay, my product has this and this vulnerability and I have fixed it or I am fixing it. I don't know about your feeling, but I think the SCADA vendors are getting there but are not there yet. And that's the reason I said take these numbers by a grain of salt is because these are only the number of vulnerabilities that have been 
disclosed or accepted. There, there, I'm pretty sure there are more vulnerabilities which are found in SCADA systems. So to study these vulnerabilities, because SCADA, as you know, is a pretty, uh, the SCADA systems are pretty huge with diverse components. What we did was we created a sort of uh, a framework by which uh, our engineers can, uh, can understand SCADA vulnerabilities. Uh, before I go into the details of this, what, 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 what I mean by our engineers is, uh, what I do is, uh, well, I actually skip the introduction part. Uh, I'm, I'm director of vulnerability research at Qualys, and what my team does is we analyze vulnerabilities, not just SCADA vulnerabilities, but vulnerabilities for basically any, any software under the sun and create signatures so that our scanner can identify these vulnerabilities, um, can identify these vulnerabilities. And for those engineers to classify SCADA vulnerabilities correctly, we, we created this framework. So I'm gonna take a moment to explain what this is. So on the left-hand side, what we have is we have components that are really away in the field, which could be in a SCADA system thousands of kilometers or miles away from the components which are on the right-hand side, which is the control center. So for now, just, just, just have this in mind is, this is the field components that could be thousands of miles away. On the right-hand side is the control center. So if we look at uh, a little bit more deeply at these components, an example of the component on the left-hand side could be um, sensors. So these are typically data acquisition components, and it could be a photo sensor, a pressure sensor, or a temperature sensor. And what they do is basically they just acquire data. So in some of the pictures that I showed you before, like an electric power line or the donut manufacturing factory, there could be a component which could sense how hard the oil is when the donuts are being fried, and that would be a temperature sensor. Or on a windmill, there could be a sensor which can detect uh, how fast are we getting the readings, how fast is the windmill blowing. And that sensor could be on the windmill, which could be, as, as I said, literally thousands of miles away from your control, cen uh, control center. So the first uh, box is the data acquisition components. They have usually a two-way communication with the second box. So now we have we acquired data. The second box typically consists of PLCs, IEDs, RTUs. These are called as data conversion components. Now, there's no rule of thumb where they can be. They can be near the data acquisition, com uh, most probably near the data acquisition uh, components, and I have, uh, these, this is what it looks like. This is like a PLC, a programmable logic controller, uh, IED, or an intelligent electronic device, that's what it's called, or a RTU, or a real-time unit. And to give you like sort of a sense of how big it is or how small it is, a typical PLC can be this big, and I, I, this, this person is uh, installing, inspecting it on, on Again, this could be anything. This could be a radio tower. It could be any type of tower. But it sort of just gives you a sense of uh, what they are. And so what they do is they basically convert uh, analog signals, which are uh, captured by our previous block. So these data acquisition components, they acquire analog signals of for temperature, pressure, light. And the PLCs typically they do is they convert these analog or discrete measures to digital information. In a lot of the cases these days, these first two boxes are mushed together, so you could find that in your infrastructures, but this is the way how uh, traditionally it, it, it could be. So uh, again, we are trying to define all SCADA systems, so this may not be like 100% accurate to your system, but this is fairly a good, good, good presentation. So all right, what we had was we had data which was acquired here. Data then gets converted. And then data gets to this final control center or SCADA master using various protocols, various uh, proprietary, non-proprietary, open source, closed source, 
tons of different protocols that uh, uh, our normal typical uh, IT engineer may not have heard of. So it consists of DNP3, Modbus, Profibus, Tejas. Uh, they say there are about 100 different SCADA protocols. I have been able to count about uh, two dozen, so I can at least say that there are that I have counted about you know, 20, 25 uh, SCADA protocols. Mm. Communication can be wired, wireless, radio, it can be from any means. So, okay, what we have till now is data gets acquired, it gets converted, it gets uh, using various communication channels which use various different protocols. The data finally gets to the SCADA master or the presentation or control or HMI. I think most people are aware of the HMI systems. They uh, they look like this. It's a control center where you go in and there are a bunch of monitors that tell you about various alarms that could be happening on the factory floor. It may tell, okay, the donuts are being fried too much, so this batch is bad. Or they may tell you about how fast the wind is blowing on the windmill. So basically what happens at HMI or presentation and control is that an operator is manned 24 by 7 to uh, respond to these alerts. So if the oil is too hot for the donuts, it, it will adjust the temperature or adjust the pressure on some valve or things like that. So these are typically uh, called as HMI, DCS, or basically SCADA master systems. So uh, with this in place, now let's take a look at some of the 2,000 vulnerabilities and which buckets do they fall in. So what we just did was we had these, we, we created these four buckets uh, of components, and now let's see where in the last year a lot of vulnerabilities fell. So um, about... I mean, since this is statistics, about almost no vulnerabilities were disclosed in the data acquisition components. And I can understand that because these components are really simple devices. They just acquire, um, they basically just sense temperature, pressure, light, whatnot. And they are very simple components. No, 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 almost no vulnerabilities there. About 11% of all vulnerabilities were in the data conversion components. So in PLCs, in IEDs, in RTUs, about 22% of vulnerabilities were in, was in SCADA communication. So it could be in protocols, SCADA protocols, Modbus, DNP3, Profibus, or any other uh, communication components. But a whooping number of 66% of vulnerabilities that we saw were in the SCADA master. And that's where I'm sort of taking you is why is why is this SCADA talk at an AppSec conference? Because a lot of vulnerabilities uh, in SCADA master, and we'll see them in, in, in a short while, they are in AppSec, AppSec type of components, which are in HMI and DCS. So uh, mm, data acquisition, as I mentioned earlier, it requires physical access, uh, and the reason there were no vulnerabilities is because field equipment does not contain any process information. At the most, uh, you will get information like uh, breaker 16 is on or valve 60 is open. And for um, here, there is really no network, no TCP IP, no network at all. So you have to be physically present if you want the photo sensor to sense something different. Uh, these are some of the examples of vulnerabilities in the, in, in, in the second component is the conversion component. And just to be fair for all, to all uh, vendors, I've taken an exam, one example of each vendor, so I'm not trying to target <laughs> any particular vendor like Emerson or Siemens or anyone. So uh, each of these examples, I've picked one example from one vendor. So it's sort of a neutral type of talk. So let's, let's look at uh, this example vulnerability. This was CVE 2013-0693. Uh, Does every, everyone know about the CVE system? This is basically how you identify the US government or MITRE actually, it assigns every vulnerability a unique identifier which is called as the CVE. So in here what happened was uh, this Emerson uh, this Emerson uh, PLC uh, RTU I believe 
it had a vulnerability where it did a beacon broadcast. So it told, it, it was broadcasting where it is basically. And that was still, I mean, you could say that it's a feature, it's not a vulnerability to let, let you know where that particular RTU is. But if attackers get on the network, then they can also listen to this beacon or broadcast and identify, oh, that is, that is where my target is, so fine. But there was another vulnerability in the same device is that the debugging port, the debug port service was left open in the production release of this appliance. So not only can an attacker know that with the help of the beacon that, oh, this is where my device is located, but now the attacker can uh, also connect to its debugging port because the service was, I mean, is, is, is open. And again, to make things even worse, the password for the debug, debugging service was hard-coded. So if I am an attacker I, and I, I somehow get uh, on the network, I know where this particular Emerson uh, rock is because it sends a network beacon. I know it, there is a debugging service open so I can connect to it and the manual has the username and password in it on how to connect to it. So basically I have full control of the device. So uh, again, as an attacker you don't really have to do any sort of tricks to connect to it. It's all open. It's uh, sort of difficult to disable it uh, once it is installed in the field. Mm, and, and this, I think, sort of gives you an, sort of a sense of what type of issues that we are seeing at this level of, or in this bucket. A patch was available from Emerson which closed the debug port, which made the network beaconing optional, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the hard-coded password since they closed the port. But this is an example of vulnerability in RTUs. Uh, another uh, similar, very similar vulnerability in a PLC from Siemens, uh, same thing, debugging port kept open on UDP 17185, or UDP port. And what I have here is the access complexity, uh, the access and the impact. So uh, CVSS, which is, uh, which is, I guess, the only standardized way to uh, measure vulnerabilities, they define access uh, in these terms, and what AV is, access vector, so where can the attacker be to compromise this vulnerability, and N says, which means that attacker can be anywhere on the network. Access complexity is low, which means how difficult is it to exploit the vulnerability. Low means it's not really difficult to exploit it. AU is authentication. Is authentication needed to exploit this vulnerability, and it says no, which means that attacker you know, doesn't need to crack any authentication because it's default username and passwords. And the impact is basically on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So if an attacker compromises this, what could happen? Can he uh, get uh, some confidential information, integrity, and availability of the systems? So these are standard CVSS metrics that are defined. And if you look up the CV, you will find them on the NIST or on the MITRE website. So uh, this was about uh, vulnerabilities in RTUs, IEDs, or PLCs. Mm, let's, let's move on to some of the vulnerabilities found in the communication components. So in the last year, there were about 24% vulnerabilities in miscellaneous components, which are basically not listed here. About 12% of vulnerabilities were in the implementation of the Modbus protocol. 16% in DNP3, 12% in C37118, 4% IGMP, 4% SNMP. Again, a pretty high right, 16% in FTP and 12% in SSH, SSL. So this uh, chart has a, uh, sort of mashes your normal protocols, SSH, FTP, Telnet, IGMP, with some SCADA specific protocols, which are Modbus, DNP3, and, and things like that. And uh, vulnerabilities in the SCADA protocols are mostly in the implementation of those protocols. As you know, these protocols, the, the SCADA protocol, so let's say the first three protocols, Modbus, DNP3, and these three guys, these are spe SCADA specific protocols. If you ask your developers saying how, how to secure this, 
they would say that these are about 30 year old protocols. So for example, Modbus was developed 30 years ago, the same time TCP IP was being developed. The way now it is being ported to TCP IP is just you put, uh, and again, that's not the talk, topic of this uh, presentation, but you just uh, take the Modbus packet, put it into your TCP packet and sort of you make Modbus work on TCP. But what I'm trying to say is they were developed the same time as TCP IP was developed and had no built-in security measures uh, into them. So like a modern day protocol, like uh, uh, you would have some security measures built into protocol. But these protocols, it was assumed that they are run in a closed environment and that's why there was no, um, no need at the time to, for, for, for security. But what happened was world, the world has changed in the, if, if you were in the SCADA or ICS world in the late 90s, what happened was a lot of uh, users as well as they asked their vendors that, hey, this thing called as Windows, it's coming up. And instead of getting me this proprietary SCADA system, like the ones that we saw earlier, why don't you port your, a lot of your components on Windows? And the SCADA vendors said, oh yeah, that's fine. We can do that. It's less cost for us. It's less cost for you. Let's do that which was a good thing, but then all the vulnerabilities and attack of vectors and exploits which were possible on Windows now are affecting your SCADA system. So um, anyway, this is the, uh, um, this is the communication uh, chart for where vulnerabilities were found. Let's, uh, and, and we will we'll take a look at it a little bit in detail. Um, so this is uh, a communication component, a Nano 10 PLC. Mm, and there was a denial of service uh, in, in, in one of the components. And then another example of Galil Rio P, uh, PLC, which is on the right hand side, there was again a denial of ser service uh, vulnerability. Schneider Electronics uh, had a Modbus remote code execution as well as uh, denial of service. And again, in this present, uh, in, in an hour, it's impossible to sort of go over or go into details of all these vulnerabilities, but you can look these CVEs up and it will point you to what the vulnerability is and all the details of, of the vulnerability. Uh, same thing, DNP3, this was a protocol developed for the electrical grid system in, uh, in, in North America. And, uh, uh, various companies like Matricon, OPC server had this, uh, again, buffer overflow NP3 vulnerability, uh, subnet, IO server, you name it. Uh, also what I want to sort of uh, get the message through is no matter what vendor you have, I mean, you, you are seeing a lot of vendors in all these slides. Some of them are small time vendors, some of them are pretty big vendors, but uh, a lot of them have vulnerabilities and, and as, as, as we mentioned before, or not, uh, not all SCADA vendors are at that maturity level where if you go on the vendor website, it is easy to find out what are the vulnerabilities in their product. So unfortunately for now, you have to rely on your, like a, a scanning vendor or something like that to find vulnerabilities or do it yourself as in uh, monitor various bulletin boards, uh, various ISC cert um, alerts to find where these vulnerabilities are. Mm, so mm, going, 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 and uh, as, as I was mentioning, a lot of these security protocols in SCADA, they were not uh, developed with security in mind because security was not a concern when that protocol was developed. So mm, there is basically no integrity, availability, or confidentiality aspect built into the protocol. So by uh, confidentiality is if you use Modbus and tell the Modbus server to um, lower the temperature of the device it is connected to, it will just do it. It will not ask you for credentials. It is not built into the protocol. It will not ask you who you are you. Or even if you say, okay, I am this and this user, it will not ask, okay, uh, let me check if you are authorized to do such and such operation. All these things, basically, confidentiality, integrity, they are not built into the protocols uh, that SCADA systems use because they were, they were designed like 30 years ago, some of them. The screenshot that I have here is a free tool um, uh, called SCADA Scan, which I have developed. This is the URL. 
And what it does is it will help you, uh, uh, it sort of brute forces some of the Modbus slave IDs. It does something with DNP3 as well, identify all your DNP3 devices. Mm, if you run this tool, do not run it on production systems, on live systems, because as you know, a lot of these uh, PLCs, IEDs, they are uh, low powered devices. If they get uh, sometimes even just a ping packet and they, they are not hard coded to know, to respond to a ping packet, they may just die or crash. So if uh, basically not just this tool, but I would just recommend if you're using any scanning tool, uh, try to find an open window. Every factory floor has some sort of a once in a quarter, some maintenance window where they clean the machinery, clean the devices. So in that maintenance mode, try to uh, make use of that maintenance mode that you have to scan or do vulnerability analysis or run tools like this that I have here on 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 your live uh, live targets. Because as you know, you don't want to be that person who ran a scan or ran a tool and caused uh, the factory floor all of a sudden to come to a grinding halt. So uh, again, some vulnerabilities, I'm not gonna even go into any of the details here. These are um, vulnerabilities related to SSH, IGMP. Now these are a lot of the protocols which are not SCADA specific. These are our uh, SSH, FTP, Telnet, IGMP normal protocols that are, are used in a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, um, take a look at the, at the vendors. And as I mentioned, uh, in the last year, almost all SCADA vendors are affected, have some sort of a vulnerability, and I've tried to just uh, put here some, some, some examples. So the last part is the SCADA master. Now, before even going to this slide, if you remember some of the pictures that I have shown this. So a SCADA master is basically uh, when you try to go into the control room, it's typically uh, secured by some bi biometric security or a guard is outside there and you have to have pretty good, you have to sort of prove who you are to get into that SCADA master uh, system. And once you are uh, in there, you see there are operators manned 24 by 7 who are looking at alerts of what is happening in the system, and they are supposed to react to it. Uh, we also talked a while ago about these systems a long time ago being proprietary. So in some of the pictures that I've shown you that there were like proprietary buttons and knobs and monitors on the on where operators look for alerts. But more and more, more and more in the last maybe 15 years or so, these systems have started looking just like your workstations. So they use basically off-the-shelf operating systems like Windows, Solaris, uh, Linux, and use off-the-shelf components, uh, ActiveX, and even now there are a lot of SCADA systems which have web applications. So you use your browser to control the SCADA system. And that's the reason actually we are here in this AppSec conference talking about SCADA is because a lot of these control systems now uh, have web servers in them, databases, so you're off the shelf, MySQL, Oracle, uh, you name what, databases into them and the operators use a browser to control these systems. So. I think all of you must have sort of got where I'm taking this. So all the vulnerabilities in the browsers now also affect your SCADA system. All the vulnerabilities that Oracle releases or patches, Oracle, you must know about Oracle critical CPUs or critical patches that they release every quarter, they affect your SCADA system. Microsoft Windows, all patched every second Tuesday of every month, Microsoft releases their patches, and your SCADA system is on Windows, so that is affected. So the exploit, so the attack vector of your SCADA system, which maybe 15, 20 years ago was a proprietary system, was pretty low. That attack surface has just expanded to AppSec and to everything. I mean, nowadays you can even search and find uh, applications from vendors that let you control your HMI from your iPhone or your Android device. So. Uh, I mean, uh, there is a usability aspect to it, but there is also a security aspect to it. And it's that balance of usability and security that uh, I guess you have to judge in your organization on how to, um, how, to, how to make that balance. 
So let's look at uh, the vulnerabilities uh, in 2013 for the SCADA master. So let's, let's generic or something which I couldn't put in any other bucket. So 5% of them were cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So 10 years ago, if you talk about cross-site scripting to a SCADA engineer, it would make no sense. But now since uh, SCADA systems are controlled using in a web browser and there is a web server serving data from the SCADA system, it all of a sudden makes sense. So we have 5% cross-site scripting in SCADA systems, um, SQL injection vulnerabilities, database-related vulnerabilities, and this 31% is a generic web app, web application vulnerability. So they were, so these generic means these are non-web app vulnerabilities, mm, but this means that these are generic web app vulnerabilities. We had directory traversal cross-site request forgery, vulnerabilities in various ActiveX controls, as well as some, some, some in crypto. So uh, now your SCADA system vendor, the developers at your SCADA system vendor, they have to be um, trained to write secure AppSec code, application secure, security enabled code. And if you are the practitioner who is in, ch in charge of securing these SCADA systems, you just don't need to know all the SCADA protocols, Modbus, DNP3, and all the SCADA stuff that you knew for the last 30 years or so, but you need to know all the AppSec-related stuff as well because all the systems are moving to in, in, in that direction. And pretty soon, I'm sure you would need to know about Android and iOS security if things take off and really people start implementing or letting their uh, operators control these systems or react to alarms from from their homes or from anywhere using their iPhones or iPads. So uh, these are just uh, some of the examples. Again, uh, a lot of vendors here in the first, uh, in the first word, um, Invensys, Siemens, uh, database object manipulation, cross-site scripting, SQL injection. So I think it's pretty clear by that first chart now why AppSec and even things like SCADA or critical infrastructure or industrial control systems are getting more and more close together. So the real world issues, the, the number one issue that we still see is, or we didn't, the one that we didn't see 30 years ago in SCADA, but we more increasingly see now is the control system network is often connected to corporate network or even to the public internet. So the control system network usually needs to be segregated from your HR system, from your payroll system, from the system in which you check your emails or things like that. The reason is because all these viruses and worms you have a um, control center where there are thick steel walls and biometric security to get in. But if the network inside is connected to your HR network and admin network and email network, then viruses and worms, they don't need to go through these thick walls. They can just jump off uh, your HR network or your admin network or whatever, your email network to your SCADA network. And that's the number one thing that at least we see wrong in the configuration is these systems are connected to your internal network mm, without much protection, or sometimes even to the wide internet. So after Stuxnet was released, uh, uh, there is this, uh, there is this uh, mm, online uh, tool called Shodan. And you, what you do is uh, S-H-O-D-A-N. You just go there and you type in uh, banners that, okay, tell me all the systems on the internet which give Apache banner. And it will give you these, or Apache 2.0. blah, blah, blah. So after Stuxnet was released, uh, I went there and said, let's check if there are any SCADA systems connected to the internet inadvertently. You put in some queries there, Siemens, this, that, and you would see even today a lot of SCADA systems being inadvertently connected to the internet. And it also has this top queries, and after Stuxnet was released, a lot of the top queries had SCADA systems in them. So people were trying to find, oh, let me check if SCADA, this SCADA system is online or that SCADA system is online. So that's, I think, the number one issue that we see is uh, 
control systems connected to the corporate network or internet. We, we saw that there is no authentication or poor user authentication mm, in many of these protocols. Some of the protocols like DNP3 support it, so if you have DNP3, make sure that it is configured in that mode, not just, uh, it's not just a checkbox that, okay, you are using the latest protocol, but it has to be configured to, to be running in that uh, mode as well. There is almost no patching in SCADA system, mm, and, and, and there is a long history about this because, okay, now you are running Microsoft Windows. Windows releases patches every month. Can you patch your SCADA system every month? The answer is no. Does your vendor, your SCADA vendor, provide you with the guidance that if you apply this Microsoft patch, your SCADA system will still work? Most probably the answer is no. And that's the reason a lot of SCADA systems still run Windows XP. In some cases, we have seen Windows 2000 and they are totally unpatched. They are, attackers don't need to even invent new vulnerabilities like Stuxnet Sorduku did. They can just use a five-year-old vulnerability because most of the SCADA systems would still be vulnerable to those because they are not patched. And the reason they are not patched is because no one wants to take that, uh, well, there are many reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, you, all, you don't want to patch your critical SCADA system every month without knowing what the patch would do. Secondly, even though you may be running a system which, is, which looks like Windows, it may be a custom blend of Windows. So your vendor has to sort of recompile the patch from Microsoft and then give that special Windows patch to you which you can apply. And it really depends on how quick your SCADA vendor is in giving you these patches and whatnot. Uh, we already talked about default passwords, or shared passwords. Uh, the, the number one thing that I get from uh, SCADA um, operators is that it's a critical system if we put passwords or difficult passwords on it and if there is a fire on the factory floor, we don't want to just, uh, you know, type wrong password and s waste time in that. But uh, I was also talking to one of, uh, in, in one of these conferences to a person from the military and they said that in the military they have like 18, 20 year old people entering 20 character passwords correctly all the time, which is changed every week. Now, I've agreed we cannot implement that in our IT systems because <laughs> no one would want to work for you if you change your password every week and it's 20 characters, but uh, we should give some thought to passwords or thought to not having passwords. We also saw there were systems which are not restarted in years. and can anyone guess why these systems are not restarted in years? Everyone knows their SCADA systems are not restarted in years. I see a lot of nodding. And because most of them are not confident that the system will come up again if they restart it. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the state uh, a lot of SCADA systems are today mm, where they are not being patched. They are really old, totally vulnerable. And that was fine if the systems were air-gapped, but now these systems are connected to the internal network or inadvertently connected to the internet, and uh, that's where alarms start ringing, and that's where really the security risk is here. We already talked about this, uh, systems using default off-the-shelf uh, browsers and all their vulnerabilities. Unnecessary services, a lot of SCADA systems are Windows, Unix systems, so they would have a lot of other unnecessary things, so you have to make sure that unnecessary services are not running. We've also seen a lot of internal differences in organizations between the SCADA engineers who manage the system and the security professionals who are trying to secure them. Inadvertently, someone has scanned some SCADA system which caused some PLC to go down and then they say that, okay, now you, you will never scan my SCADA system ever again. And it just, we have seen this just too many times where mm, I think uh, security really loses in, in, in this battle. Another one, I mean, the real challenge with SCADA systems is the long life cycle. If there was a vulnerability in my laptop, I would replace it in a year or two years. But the challenge here is these systems are built to last for decades, if not for multiple decades. So it's extremely uh, difficult to upgrade even some components of the system and forget about upgrading you know, the whole system right from the sensors that we saw, which are 
thousands of miles away to the control center. Uh, proposals, we have maybe just a minute left, or maybe, maybe even not that. Uh, Keda network auditing, try to do vulnerability scanning, auditing in the downtime. Mm, and again, talk with your SCADA, uh, your SCADA engineers, because your uh, security tools that you run may and most probably will affect the SCADA system. Check if your system is inadvertently exposed to the internet. We have seen this many times. Uh, on, on paper, the system looks good, but in time, because someone needs access to email in their control center, they, con they connect it to a different network, and it gets inadvertently exposed to the internet. Strategies for software updates and patching is an important one, and if possible, try to get a SCADA test environment. This, I know, is very difficult because a test environment almost cost half or maybe one third of the real system, so it's very easy for me to come here and say, have a SCADA test environment, but if you don't have it, don't feel bad. Most people are really have struggling to have a SCADA test environment because it's just so expensive where they can test the patches and then deploy to production system. Most people just have one system, which is their production system. All right, so this is a little bit about the tool that I mentioned. Mm, again, the slides are on uh, on the, mm, you, you can look at that. And uh, also, if you want to know more about SCADA vulnerabilities, I tweet about it pretty often, so you can follow me. This is the link to the Google, uh, for, to the tool, and then there are some other interesting SCADA articles uh, at, 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 at my website. So we are out of time. I'll take questions uh, outside of the hall after this because there is another session at 12. Thank you for coming here. Thank you.